So I'm going to look at Luke 11. If you want to turn there or just look up here, you can see it uh, on the screen. This was one of those rules of engagement um, verses that always stuck with me about spiritual warfare. And uh, Jesus was being challenged by the religious people. Um, that's, that's a whole part of the strategy, I think, of the enemy is to get us to lock into religious thinking and forget that the Spirit of God, right from Genesis chapter 1 in the first verses, he's hovering, right? He's moving. Uh, he's never the same twice, never exactly the same twice. God never changes, but the way he expresses himself keeps changing. And as, as human beings, life's complicated, and, and we like to try to put them in boxes, uh, but it doesn't fit. <laughs> so look at what it says. If I'm casting out demons, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees who are accusing him of being full of demons. If I'm casting out demons by God's mighty power, God's kingdom is now released upon you. So we should say that about ourselves. God's kingdom is now released upon us because it's here, right? The kingdom of God is here. It's present. It's available to us. And when Mike Hutchins was praying for people uh, over the weekend, he was pulling in the, the presence of the kingdom into our reality. Let, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, okay? How does that relate to bitter root judgments is that's part of the rules of engagement. When we hold bitterness against other people and we judge them and we devalue them through that judgment, which is different than just having discernment, right? But when we judge them in a negative way, then we're devaluing something that God values and we're basically making a decision in our heart that they'll never change. That's the difference between an expectation and a judgment, right? But I love the way this is worded in the Passion. It says, when a strong man, that would be the devil, with many weapons is guarding his palace, his possessions are safe. So you could picture a big guard standing in front of a, a, a hurting person, and the hurting person back here is locked up in that prison uh, of needing that deliverance that has to come forth. But the strong man, the devil, is standing there with his arms crossed, and he feels like his possessions are safe until we see, but when, right? But when one stronger than he comes to attack and overpower him, that's Jesus, Jesus comes into that situation where we're bound in addiction as a good example and says, you know what, the addiction may be strong, but I'm stronger. <laughs> and I'm going to break that addiction off of you. And not only does he overpower and attack the enemy, the stronger one, Jesus will empty the arsenal in which he trusted. So for those of you that might be battling addiction, as an example, that, that enemy has an arsenal against you. Jesus empties out that arsenal and he has no weapons to use against you anymore. And I remember struggling with addiction many years ago, thinking I was always going to have to deal with this desire to want it, but I just would have to have enough willpower to say no. And it turned out that Jesus took the desire away. I didn't want to do it anymore, which made it much less of a struggle. And that's how freedom is. And we know that Jesus quoted this, Isaiah 61, in Luke chapter 4, when he was in the temple and he un unrolled the scroll and he read from Isaiah 61. He said, he sent me to heal the wounds of the brokenhearted and to tell captives you are free and to tell prisoners, be free from your darkness. That's what deliverance does. But this is what a bitter root will keep you in because the bitter root judgment stops the blessing of God from flowing because, like I said, you're devaluing something that he holds in value. So I, I have a hard time talking about this without also talking about the supernatural power of forgiveness because the way to get out of the bitter root judgment in your heart is to have to extend forgiveness to the person that you've judged, to the one usually because they hurt you or because they, they betrayed you, they promised you something and it didn't come through, or they let you down in some way. And then Jesus, quoting Isaiah 61, said, I'm sent to announce a new season of Yahweh's grace and a time of God's recompense on his enemies to comfort all who are in sorrow and I love this one, to strengthen those crushed by despair, all right? So that's why we teach on deliverance. That's why we have a deliverance ministry. It's not just for the people in King of Kings Church. It's for whoever needs it, and, and that's the way we've done it, and we'll continue to do it that way. So this is, this is where the portion of Scripture where the term bitter roots comes from. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a, a context of it because I'm guessing most of you know Hebrews 11. What would we call that? Right up here, you can see it. It's the Hall of Faith, right? The, the Hall of Faith of the Old Testament heroes that we read about. And it goes on and on and on. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Moses. 
one after another after another, and then the author near the end says, and time doesn't even allow me to talk about this one and that one and the other one. It's a great study to just uh, read Hebrews 11. And then it gets to 12, and it's referencing back and says, since, right? Since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, it would say in the uh, New King James, that in the voice it says, surrounded by all those who have gone before us, let us drop every extra weight. He's comparing it to a marathon race now, right? And if you're weighed down by things, you can't run as quickly. And um, what a kingdom theology and a kingdom mindset does for us is to say, we have a set amount of time left here on this planet, right? We're, you know, unless the Lord comes back, we're going to pass from this life and then return with him when he comes back for good. And I want to make the most of, of, of what I have, of that time that I have here. So this is a great example of, of using a marathon race as what the rest of our life looks like. And that's why it's good to take care of yourself and be healthy. And I know it says that bodily exercise profiteth little, <laughs> but it still, still does profit. And eating well and getting enough sleep and, and honoring the Sabbath and doing all those things makes you a more, potentially, a more effective minister, right? So he said, let us drop every extra weight and every sin that clings to us and slackens our pace. And that's what a bitter root judgment will do. If you're holding on to a judgment against somebody, you're slackening your pace because God can't bless that. And you're bound to reap the thing that you judged. That's another thing that we're going to talk about here. And that's, that's a hard thing for people to grasp. So I'm, I'm going to go through it in a way, hopefully, that you'll feel free to ask questions along the way if it's confusing. If we'll just think of Joyce Meyer as an example, as somebody who's such a well-known public figure as a, as a minister. I didn't know uh, her story, you know, the dark side of her story about the sexual abuse that she w went through for years as a high school student from her father, right? So she could have easily hated her father and held a judgment against him, right? But that runs into the, the commandment in the Bible that says, you shall honor your mother and father, that life may go well with you, right? So, man, like you said, well, how, how could you honor somebody who's not honorable? But God is not asking us to only do it when they're honorable. <laughs> He's asking us to do it. And it seems really unfair. It's not that you're saying that what they did is okay, you're saying that I'm not going to hold the unforgiveness as poison in my system. I'm going to let the Lord take vengeance on this person, and I'm going to pray for them. I'm, in her case, her father, she led him to the Lord before he died. She said, I was actually able to kiss him on the cheek and not feel sick inside. You know, supernatural. Supernatural. But she had to break the judgment that she had made against him from a very valid position of, of, of having a reason to hate him. Except that the way the devil works is that he, he uses that bitterness in our system to slow us down. And it becomes this thing that clings to us and slackens our pace. And Jesus said, if you, if you can think of, of, of something that you're holding against somebody, lay your gift down and go get right before you bring the offering. Remember? He's like, this is part of that cleansing of our pump. And I want to run with endurance, right? Get rid of everything that slackens our pace and run with endurance that long race that's before us. Lift up your hands that are dangling and brace your weakened knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame in you, excuse me, won't be put out of joint but will heal. Linnell was just identifying that, right? And, and that's something that you'll hear a lot in the classes that, that we run and, and the testimonies. And, and often it is around forgiveness where people say, I really thought I forgave that person. But then I realized there was another layer that I hadn't achieved yet. And in the, in the teaching through Possessing Your Vessel, the title of that message is called Accomplishing Forgiveness, which means there's stages of, the, of forgiveness typically, especially when the hurt has been very deep. And you go through one step and you're like, yeah, okay, I don't want him to go to jail anymore. <laughs> Maybe that's a pretty serious example. Or, you know, if I saw them, I wouldn't feel sick to my stomach, but I sure don't want to invite them over to my house. Or, you know, like these layers that happen until you get to a point where, you feel like the, the slate is clean. They owe me nothing, and I'm going to be happy to pray for them that, that God will touch their heart and show them the reality of a relationship with Jesus, right? So that's, that's what this is. Lift up your hands. Don't let them dangle. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame in you won't be put out of joint but will heal. And when you break the judgment, you're, you're taking yourself a step closer to that healing that's needed. 
uh, and this is the verse, right, in, in Hebrews chapter 12. It says, pursue peace with all people. I'd like to stop there for a minute because the last year that we've been in, and especially with the election and how contentious it is, it, you, you wouldn't think that a lot of Christians are pursuing peace with all people, right? So could that be one of the things that is slowing us down and slackening our pace as we're trying to run this race with the Lord? It could be. So you could have a bitter root judgment against somebody in your family because they called you out at Thanksgiving over something to do with politics. Let me just tell you, you shouldn't let them have that much power over you. We want to run the race to win. And, and if you're letting them rent space in your head, that's what, the, uh, that's what the recovery people talk about. Like, You're not that good. I'm not letting you rent space in my head because I have a race that I want to run, and you're slowing me down. By holding this hatred in my heart towards you, you're slowing me down. And, and Jesus wants to heal that, but he also wants us to pray for our enemies, quote, unquote, you know, enemies. If it's our family members. We might be the only Christian they know, right? So we're there for a reason. So pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. So it's not just us that's defiled when we're carrying these bitter roots. It ripples. It's got a ripple effect into other relationships in our lives. And especially when other people are looking at you and saying, well, that's a Christian. I know they identify as a Christian, but they seem to be treating that person in a really unchristian way. What, what is that? It's a judgment in your heart. It's, it's a, 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 like you're, you're, um, like I said, you're defiled, but you're also defiling other people by the example that you're setting, potentially. I don't hope it doesn't sound like a, a condemning message. It's important that we recognize them because we have to repent of them. At, at the root, it's a, it's a sin that has to be repented of. And it's easy to do it with people in your family. Now, we've been doing this, right? I mean, since we, we first came out here, we went through, I forget now, I think it was 13 weeks for, uh, on Friday mornings for 13 weeks, for four hours, right? Add that up, whatever the math is there. And we got certified to, to, you know, to teach this material and, you know, really dug in a lot. And, and the Sanford just have this wealth. John and Paul Sanford, uh, we recommend the book. It's called Transforming the Inner Man by Charisma House Publishing is one of the four. But this is a quote from that material. And if you just look at the right, it says, Bitter Roots, Not Brought to the Cross, defile, we just read that, right, from Hebrews 12, 15, and may be the most powerful negative force in our lives. Whoa. For the Sanfords to say that, I mean, this is after 40 years of ministry, they're saying that this could be one of the most powerful negative forces in our lives. So it's really something to contend with and do the deep dive in your heart and say, am I holding a judgment against somebody? Because if there's fruit of the judgment, there's probably a root of a judgment, right? We know that that's a common phrase here. Where there's fruit, there's a root. And let's just say it this way. Everybody produces fruit every day. It's up to you whether it's good or bad. But, the, but you can't be Switzerland, you know, and just say, oh, no, we're just a neutral country. We're not in this fight. You know, The tree doesn't have to try to produce fruit. It will produce fruit. It's just what's the quality of it? And maybe that sounds like a works mentality to some people. I think that's a lazy approach to take. It's not a lazy, uh, it's not a, a works mentality. It's saying, like I said, I have a set number of days left between now and when I leave this earth. And I don't want to let the devil have any ground in my heart. Remember what Jesus said? The, the prince of the, this world is coming for me, but he has nothing in me. Wow. What a thing to be able to say. I'm not there yet, but I'm going to keep trying. So, you know, that's, that's the quote out of this uh, Bitterroots page, uh, the, the intro in the material that they gave. And it says, the law of judgment applies not only to our conscious actions, known and performed outwardly, but also to what is lodged in our heart. Yeah. That's a picture, isn't it? Something could be lodged in your heart from, from being a young child. It just gets stuck in there. And then you keep moving, but it didn't leave. So it's buried under there. And then the next word is suppressed, or I'm sorry, repressed, unknown and unexpressed. Once formed, judgments bring results. And bitter roots not brought to the cross defile and may be the most powerful negative force in our lives, bringing destruction to us and those around us, right? By many, they become defiled, right? So something that we really have to contend with. 
I'm not sure you guys could see this on the camera, but the, those of you here hopefully could see this. It's a great picture that we refer to often when we do this teaching. And I'll just read it. It says, mankind's sinning is like a man who throws a ball against the wall. At some point, it will return to him. And he quotes Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. All right, Galatians 6, 7. The longer our sin goes unrepented, the larger it grows. I don't know if you believe that one, but he's about to quote another verse from Hosea. They sow the wind, but they reap the whirlwind. Now, in this example, we're using it negatively to say that if you don't repent of the sin, it doesn't just go away. In fact, it grows bigger. Like, and that's why that ball, when it's coming back at him, is larger than the one that he threw. But it's the law of increase works on both blessings and curses, right? So if the curse could grow larger over time, so can the blessing. So when you sow a blessing, you sow the wind and you reap the whirlwind. So it's not just a negative connotation for, for that verse. And then, I, I didn't read that part, but it says, By the time the sin returns to be reaped, it has grown to overwhelming proportion. And then he's quoting James 1, and it says, The desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Right? So stages that James talks about of, of the way this works in our lives. So we think we did something a long time ago, and it wasn't that big a deal. But because it's been allowed to percolate, and it got lodged in our heart, now it's like an, in, an inner Archie Bunker. <laughs> you guys know who I'm talking about? <laughs> right? <laughs> That has to be crucified, right? Anytime Archie pops up, he has to be crucified. And that show really was brilliantly written by a Jewish person who had experienced a lot of persecution. And, and he used comedy to show how bad it is, right, and how it was just so accepted in our culture without even thinking about it. And, and it really got a lot of good it got a, got a, lot, a lot of good done in the culture because people realized I should be more careful about what I'm saying. Right? Like, whatever. I won't go into some of the examples there. But this is the better picture, right, is that what stops that ball from hitting us is the cross between us. And we don't have to reap getting hit by that bowling ball when we threw a little ping pong ball and it's coming back as a bowling ball at us because the cross stands in the way. And then he says, the John Sanford's notes here, says, God, unwilling that any should perish, sent Jesus to identify with us in all our sinfulness, right? Wow. Thank you, Lord. Jesus took our sin upon himself and died with it for us once for all. Isn't that beautiful? That's Hebrews, right? Not every year the priest doesn't have to keep bringing more goats and bulls to be slaughtered once. Jesus died once for all people for all time. Our sin was canceled and the law of sowing and reaping was fulfilled in him. And then he quotes Matthew 5, 17, Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. That's part of the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, So in that Sermon on the Mount, he talks about unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees. Remember that? And if you think about who he was talking to there, it was uneducated people. And the Pharisees were the ones that had the power in the culture because they were allowed to spend all their lives just studying but they pulled rank on people. They used their intelligence and their learning to make other people feel less than. And there's many examples, right? Luke chapter 15, when Luke is with, I'm sorry, when Jesus is with the tax collectors and sinners and the Pharisees are standing nearby, there's really interesting language there. It says the tax collectors and sinners were drawn to Jesus, right? It doesn't say they were drawn to the Pharisees. They were drawn to Jesus. Now, a holy God normally would bring conviction on people, but there was something about Jesus that the sinners knew that he was righteous but weren't, weren't repelled to run away. They ran towards him. That's a little convicting, right? Is anybody being drawn to you and me? Or are they feeling repelled because they think we're going to judge them? <laughs> Bitter root judgment, right? Like that's, that's where that thing could surface. And it's, it's really ironic the way that whole chapter plays out. I won't go into it in too much detail, but... Jesus loves those tax collectors and sinners, but he also loves the Pharisees because they were representing his father's business. And, you know, it feels a little irreverent to call the church the father's business, but, but in that culture, the priests represented God to the people, but they were misrepresenting God to the people because they were judging them. And this is very common today, right? I mean, it's, it, the, the judgment level in our culture is higher now than it's ever been in my lifetime. 
that's what the cancel culture is, basically. It's saying you made a mistake, you're done, you're out. And, and people, you know, don't have any recourse. There's no forgiveness. There's no mercy, no grace, no extending of forgiveness. It's just done. Thank God that we're not in that kingdom. <laughs> All right? So he, again, in Luke 15, he tells this story, and he says, okay, because he knows the, the, uh, tax, uh, the Pharisees can hear him, right? And he, he's talking to these tax collectors and sinners, and the Pharisees are going, man, I can't believe it. We thought he, he had potential. But look at him. He's hanging out with the wrong crowd. So Jesus says there was uh, a person who had 100 sheep, lost one, went and found the sheep, brought it back, had a party. A lady had 10 coins, lost one, went and found it, had a party. A man has two sons, lost one, found it. The older brother didn't want to have a party, did he? See, see what happens. Who's the older brother? The Pharisees. But he did it in a way where they were nodding in the beginning, and then they got to that aha moment there. And then they go into the party, and the older brother's left outside having to decide. You decide whether it's a good thing that God is accepting these Gentiles in because you think they don't deserve to come in because you've judged them as not worthy, but you also then would lose your status. Ha! I'm just going to spend a minute on that, okay, because that's a problem in the church today still. This status thing that, you know, this church, is it's not a good fit for you. You know, you, you should probably go to this other church down the block, right? Now, hopefully we would never say that, but I can't say, you know, I don't know. Maybe somebody felt that way when they came here. But that's probably the, one of the greatest sins, right, is that we start to decide whether they're not the right fit for us. Well, unless they're just dangerous, yeah. I mean, we don't want to have dangerous people in the church. We're not letting them bring a gun in, you know, or, or however. But, but we want them to get whole, and, and we want them to get healthy. All right, I, I'm not going to belabor that point too long. I just think we have to be super careful in 2021 that we're in to say, I'm not being impacted by that culture. I'm going to be somebody who, who ministers in the opposite spirit of what the culture is doing. All right, so this is from their notes. A bitter root occurs when we make an angry, bitter judgment against someone. And they say usually our parents because the parents are the ones that have the most time with us typically. Or if one of them was missing, that would be an easy way to make a bitter root judgment that, you know, why weren't you there for me, right? Usually our parents. A bitter root expectancy is different than a judgment, but it usually precedes a judgment. Like we would say spiritual adultery occurs before adultery. There, there's a, a setup process that happens of anticipating this. And a bitter root expectancy is my dad always tells me he's going to make it to the game and then he never comes to the game. And when he gets home, he doesn't even say, I'm sorry, I didn't go. So I'm not even expecting him to come anymore because I'm setting myself up for a fall. See, it's still just an expectancy, though, at that point. Or it could be in a marriage. And, you know... <sighs> Love is blind uh, until the honeymoon, right? <laughs> and then your eyes get open, <laughs> is what they say. I don't believe that, but that's like one of those sayings. But like, but when you were dating, there was one version of a relationship. Now that you're married and you're really counting on each other and kids start coming along, it's like, man, you know, I was really counting on you to do this for me, but you're letting me down. Now, that never happened with me and Trish, but I've heard done marriage counseling. So I know people have been disappointed with each other sometimes. And, you know, that's a wrong approach to a marriage because you said for better or for worse, we're going to stick this thing out together and, and I'm going to become one with you and we're going to make this thing work, whatever that means, right? But you could feel disappointed. And you could say, well, you know, I've asked you five different times and you've, you've, you've said yes and not done it, so I'm not even going to bother asking anymore. So that's an expectancy. It's a bitter root expectancy that even though I'm asking you, you're not responding to me. The judgment is when the cement hardens. And you say, you'll never do that thing I'm asking you to do for me. That's a sin. Because you've just taken God out of the formula. Because God can change anybody's heart at any time. Right? But cement needs to then be pounded with a jackhammer. So when you can catch it in the expectancy phase, you can nip it in the bud. And that would be, well, clearly would be our uh, advice to you. And I'm going to try to give you some real practical ways to do that. One of, one of the practical ways is just ask for input. You know, give your spouse, give your close people, uh, your closest friends permission to say, hey, I sense 
you're, you're starting to say, sar, let's use sarcasm as an example. When is it good to use sarcasm? <laughs> Never. One psychologist called it scarcasm because you're revealing a bitterness in your heart. Like, it's usually really funny, though, right? <laughs> like, that's the, that's the bad thing about it, that it's funny, but you, it's at someone else's expense. And, and there might be some truth in it, but there's that bitter taste that it's left in their mouth, right? And then, you know, a lot of times humor is funny because it's true, but, but there's a mocking side to it. And, and it's not grace-filled, right? So that's a warning sign. That could be the expectancy stage. You haven't gotten to the judgment yet, but we're sure heading in the wrong direction. So if you find yourself feeling that way towards your spouse, sarcastic responses all the time, you're in that preliminary stage of, of, of the cement hardening in your heart against that. So they'll talk about expectancy here, and, and he uses an example. What a man is brought up by a mother who tends to be cru- critical of him. He learns to protect his heart by simply withdrawing, not sharing his feelings, and not letting her know where he is with his emotions. So you probably, if you're, if you're a boy, you probably can remember this happening as a child. You run outside, you go in with your friends, you go down and you find a tree swing in the woods somewhere, and you're having a blast with your friends, and you come in the house and you're all excited. Mom, it was the coolest thing. We were down there. And she looks at your jeans and she's like, what happened to your jeans? You ripped your jeans in your knee. What were you doing? Having fun. <laughs> Being a boy. <laughs> it's what we do. We climb trees and jump out. <laughs> this is what you're hearing as the kid now. Oh, okay. So next time, what am I going to do when I come in? <laughs> Name, rank, and serial number. Make them into shorts. Right? You, you cut them off and say, oh, mom, I just wanted to make sure. Anything to, to prevent that attack that you're feeling as a kid because you did it innocently. That's not to say you should just look past all that stuff. But, you know, boys do want to be boys. And this is, could be, you know, part of that critical approach of the mother. And it's also true that men, when they're raising their sons, understand that there has to be some rough and tumble play. And, and the women typically think that's more dangerous than the men do, right? And it might be. But the guys are saying, well, he's going to have to be able to defend himself, especially if you grow up in New Jersey, right? <laughs> Somebody's going to pick on you at some point, and you don't want to raise your son to think that they can't defend themselves. I'm not starting the fight, but they should be able to take care of themselves if somebody threatens them, right? That's just good training. So that's an example where two people that have good, um, what, they, they, have the, they have the right motive, the mom is saying, I don't want him to get hurt. And the father's saying, I, I need him to learn how to take care of himself. And he's going to be okay. Uh, then you might have a difference of opinion. So anyway, in this case, the word critical. The mom is always critical. And we need verbal validation when we're growing up, right? We need, as uh, Dr. Dobson's teaching would say, much more positive than negative words being spoken to us if we're going to have confidence that, that – you know, we are who God says we are. So he learns to protect his heart by simply withdrawing, not sharing his feelings, not letting her know where he is with his emotions. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Bad. That's a really bad thing. He's withholding his emotions from his wife. The most important person in the world, other than the relationship with the Lord, this is to become one, but he shut down through no fault of the wife because it was the expectancy that he brought into the marriage. And she's not understanding why he doesn't want to talk to her. He forms a picture of what a woman is, that it's going to be like his mother. The way she treated him becomes his picture of women in general. When he marries, he's already formed a mindset to expect that any woman, and especially his wife, will be just like his mother. He's afraid of pain if he becomes vulnerable. right? So if I'm honest and I said, you know, what, what, I, I'm, in, I'm in sales. Let's just say I have a sales job, and I come home, and I say, oh, man, I can't believe it. I worked so hard on this, and I, and I didn't get the sale. I lost it to my competition. What's he expecting the wife to say? You idiot! If you had just not gone with your friends bowling, like Ralph Cramden, you know, I'm thinking of Ralph Cramden. If you hadn't gone bowling and you worked on that presentation, you would have made the sale. That's not what he needs at that moment, is it? Right? So if that's what he's expecting... And the wife says, how'd you do at work today, honey? What's he going to say? Fine. But the woman's like, well, what else besides fine? But he doesn't feel comfortable to share his heart. And it might not even be her fault. 
but it's because he has this expectancy, okay? He's afraid of pain if he becomes vulnerable. So he protects himself and does everything he can to keep from being vulnerable with his wife. Big mistake. His wife is lonely because he's so withdrawn. So what does she do? She's wounded by the rejection and appeals to him to share, but he interprets that as her being critical, <laughs> badgering and being a nagging wife, which wounds her even further and causes a reaction. She's continually trying to break through the walls of his heart, but he has forced her into a corner where he's bound to fulfill his expectations of what, quote, unquote, of what a woman should be. The judgment is the next step. Okay, so that's bad. That was the expectancy, but the judgment is worse because that's based on the operation of the law, and the law and the word of God is what we read, sowing and reaping, okay? So once the judgment is made and you're basically writing the person off and saying they can't change, that's my kind of low, low-level definition of what it means is that now you have sinned because you've judged them, and you're bound to now reap the thing that you did. And... It happens, you know, every time we run this class, people just start thinking about, oh, yeah, I, I swore that my child would never be like my mother. <laughs> That's a judgment. And then your child's seven years old, and boom, she says something, and you go, oh, you know, I just saw my mother in, in my daughter. Right? How did that happen? It happened by the operation of law, because the very thing you judge is what you get. <laughs> Yeah, it's a wow. It's not fun. It's, it's on the basis of God's law, right? So Galatians 6, 7, and 9, what you give is what you get. What you sow, you harvest. Those who sow seeds into their flesh will only harvest destruction from their sinful neighbor, nature, but those who sow seeds into the Spirit shall harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. May we never tire of doing what is good and right before God, right? So this is a process that we're talking about, right? Linnell actually referred to it when she came up here. She said, man, I thought I had gotten progress in that area, but then I'm sitting in the conference and I realized, here we go again. There's another layer. There's more. It's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> another layer to deal with. But that's okay because what's the net result? When you live in that open position where you're asking the Lord to show you these things, you are, are removing those weights that are so easily besetting you, right? It says it that way. Let's get rid of those besetting sins. So may we never tire of doing what is good and right before God, our Lord, because in his season, we shall bring in a great harvest if we just can persist. And, and that's really how this whole process works of deliverance and working through it for yourself, but also working through it with other people. Because I know some of you are being trained to, to help do ministry for, of deliverance for other people. So it can be easy to get discouraged if you're not seeing the progress happening fast enough. But it can go in stages sometimes. And, and this revelation will hit and the light goes on. And then, and, you know, this, that's this persistence that he's talking about. Again, I don't know how good you can see this on, on the TV at home, but hopefully those of you that are here can see it. You can see on the, on the left there, um, yeah, your left, the Bitterroot Expectancies, there's a couple of different streams where that can end up. The one all the way to the, uh, your left says, you work to earn love. Okay, so what would we call that in the uh, Possessing Your Vessel class when somebody has a problem where they think they have to work to earn love? Performance orientation, right, where you're believing a lie that you're only going to be loved if you perform well, and you won't be loved if you don't perform well, so don't ever let anybody know you're not performing well, right? It's exhausting, <laughs> and it can happen in churches very easily, so not here in Jesus' name. So that's one potential of a bitter root expectancy is that you think you're only going to be loved if you perform well based on that culture. An inner vow is I'm never going to be like my mother. I'm never going to be like my father. I'm never going to trust a man. You know, there's a whole bunch of things that you could say based on your experience that you make a vow, and it has a lot more power than you realize, but it comes, again, from those expectancies. You know, the lessons that the world teaches you are, are very, uh, like, the, it's a cold, cruel world out there, right? That's, that's one of the common sayings that we all understand. Do it unto them before they do it unto you, right? It's not Christian. That's that expectancy of an inner vow, like, I'm never going to let a man take advantage of me again. I'm never going to, whatever, fill in the blank. Then hearts of stone is where you just shut off your heart and you can't receive love. You could, you could serve and you can give it, but you're not going to open yourself up to being loved again because it hurt too much. 
When I was nine, I had a dog, and I had her out, and I took her off the leash, and she got hit by a car, and, and it was my fault. You know, I took all the blame on her being killed, and I said, I never want another dog again. But, you know, that was a nine-year-old's way of reacting. But in that area, you just don't want to even chance getting hurt again, right? That's what a heart of stone's about. And then there's this stage of judgment, which is really a dangerous place to be because you're, you've eliminated God from the picture. And then these are the fruits that come off of that tree of bitter root judgment is you get, you become what you judge. The very thing that you hated, you reap back on that law of sowing and reaping. It's an operation of the law, so it's like gravity, whether you like it or not. And then many other people are defiled. And look, it's not something to be uh, beaten up about and, and scourge yourself about it. It's just to recognize it's very serious. They said it right up front. Probably the one of the most damaging thing they deal with in their counseling practice when they were alive was this bitter root judgment. But also one of the areas that we see great progress in when people release the judgment. Dramatic, incredibly dramatic results that we've seen over the years as I'm thinking back, you know, through 20 years of doing this. One guy um, came from Market Street Mission, and he hadn't talked to his mother in seven years. He was holding a grudge against her, had, had judged her, and, and, and you know, in that way had sinned against her. And he picked up the phone and called her. No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not remembering the details right. She picked up the phone and called him after he prayed to release the judgment. After seven years, like the next day. Like, you, you couldn't explain it any other way than supernatural because he released something in the spirit and it opened the door for them to communicate. And I don't think it's too easy for a mom to not want to talk to her child. Like, that's got to be a pretty darn serious thing. That Whatever happened to make that happen, got to be pretty extreme. All right, so how does it go from that expectancy to the judgment? So he says, okay, take a similar scene of that guy that had a critical mom, and now he's married, right? The expectancy that the woman will be critical hardens into a condemning judgment against his mother. Now, not his wife, against his mother. That's the sin. Honor your mother and father that life may go well with you. That's in Ephesians, right? That's the first commandment with a promise. And what the Sanfords would say is if you don't honor your mother and father, life will not go well with you in whatever area you're not honoring them. And you could say, well, they weren't honorable. And God would say, well, I didn't ask you about that part. I just said honor them. You could always find something good about them because they got you here. You know, it might have been a mess after that, but they got you here. You could always find something redeemable about them. And that's, that's on us to give them a break. Just say, you know what? I don't know that they did such a great job, but I bet you they did the best they could with what they had. And I don't know what kind of pain that they lived through and, and, you know, we'll talk about that in this class because that's just a generally good approach to take towards people anyway. So because this man, he hated the way his mother was and nursed that dislike, as he grows older, he forgets that he made that powerful judgment as a younger kid. And he becomes a Christian and knows it's not right to hate anybody, especially not your mother, right? He gets pushed down on the inside. I'm sorry, that, that feeling gets pushed down on the inside and forgotten. But it's been sown as a seed because it went from expectancy to judgment. And now he will reap through his wife and through other women. He'll project a picture of disrespect towards the women he meets, but it's subtle. It's in a look. It's in the tone of voice. But, you know, if it's anything like my wife, she's very discerning. And she'll pick up on that and know that something's not right here, right? That it's, a, it's not the right vibe He'll project that picture of disrespect in the office. He has trouble with women employees. In the church, he attracts the wrong kind of response from the women when they sense the disrespect in, in his tone. They feel put down by him, and so they make judgments against him. <laughs> Talk about a setup from the devil. All because Adam and Eve, man. All from eating that tree. Eating from that tree of knowledge of good and evil way back when. So... This is where the roots come in, right? That process ends up with a complicated and powerful dynamic that prevents healthy relationships for this person. And he has no idea that it goes way back down into all these roots that he's forgotten all about. Now, why uh, we love the Sanford so much is because it's a prophetic ministry, okay? John Sanford especially had a strong prophetic gift. And 
instead of going through questionnaire after questionnaire and you know talking to people on a surface level he would they would pray paula and john and taught their staff to just pray and ask the lord to reveal the roots if there's if there's fruit up on the surface there's got to be a root here and we don't want to take 18 years of questionnaires to find out what it is you know what it is lord you bring a memory to them you show them as we're praying we're going to fast and pray and ask you to get there because there's a lot of work that needs to be done and this person has been held back by these besetting sins long enough But is it easy to get them to repent of that sin? No, because they would say, I don't want to forgive them. They don't deserve to be forgiven. But did you? No, (laughs) all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But I feel like I'm letting them off the hook. They owe me an apology. Right. Oh, my. You could put a bunch of conditions on it, but you're probably not going to get it based on those conditions. Whatever, we'll get there. So it's not that just that he's disrespecting them in the vibe. He planted a seed, and because of the law of sowing and reaping, he has to reap it back until he repents, until he breaks that sin. And John Sanford, as he's writing, he said, we went out to teach this into the body of Christ, and we found that people did not understand expectancy and bitter root judgments at all. Have any of you ever gone to a class in a church on this topic? here (laughs) i'm just saying over the years people say how come i've been a christian 20 years i never heard of this stuff it's right in the bible but it's i don't know i'm not going to try to solve that problem just saying they said it's the most destructive thing in people's lives holding a bitter judgment against people so he said they went out to teach it nobody understood it we realized the reason For that is because people don't understand the power of God's law. And then he used the example, if I drop my pen, why does it fall? There's a law, right? A a natural law of gravity. If I don't catch the pen and it falls to the ground and breaks, was God mad at the pen? (laughs) Right? No. It's just an operation of the law. So then they would use the example, well, if I want to have sex with five people and we're both consenting adults, nobody got hurt. This is what one of our new government officials said recently. Consenting adults, nobody gets hurt. They're consenting adults. Oh, really? And the topic was legal prostitution. It's consenting adults. You know, nobody gets hurt. Really? The family didn't get hurt. The wife didn't get hurt for the man that was buying the legal prostitution, you, you become one with the person that you join with in that intimacy and, and you leave a fragment of yourself with them behind and you're bringing all kinds of spirits in your house with you. You think nobody got hurt. Are you kidding me? You're completely oblivious to the spiritual laws behind it. And that's death trap, right? So there is an operation of the law, but if they're not recognizing it, they're thinking nobody gets hurt, even though the statistics completely bear out that this culture's falling apart. So let's do more of what we're already doing that's not working. That'll change it. So we already touched on this a little. Children, obey your parents. This is Ephesians 6. Obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your mother and father, which is the first commandment with a promise. All right? It's got a condition to it that life may go well with you and you'll live long on the earth. That's Deuteronomy 5.16. Jesus goes another step further and says, you thought you had 10 commandments. I'm giving you number 11 now. A new commandment I give you. Oh, boy. Love one another. Oh, that sounds easy, Jim. I'm going to love you. But he says, no, he didn't stop there. Love as I have loved you, Peter. You have to love Jim. Did Jesus judge me? (laughs) Could he have? Oh, man. Ten times a day, right? Like how how you just have to throw yourself on the mercy of the court and say, God, thank you for forgiving me for my stupidity, for the dumb decisions I made, for the the ways I got angry and I let my emotions get the best of me and could have died when friends that I went to high school with got on a motorcycle and crashed and killed themselves, right? And I was at the same party or so many of those things. Like many of my friends from high school are gone. What? He spared me for a reason. I mean, I, I, it wasn't my, wasn't my brilliance, I promise you that. So, wow, how could you give me this commandment, Lord? I don't have the ability to love other people the way you loved me. 
completely unconditionally, but he didn't say it's a new suggestion. <laughs> so as hard as it might be, join the club. Here we are, you know, healed people trying to heal other people, hopefully, right? So that's the goal. And then Ephesians 4, man, I just love this part. And I'm, I'm going to expand a little bit from the bitter root judgment to talk about the reality check of what makes it hard not to judge people, okay? Because, you know, the, the longer we've taught this and people would come back to class, I think it might have been even you, Adrian, one time when you said, I, I keep going to that class, I never realized how messed up I am. <laughs> and like, you know, like another satisfied customer, you know, lifetime membership, you can keep coming back <laughs> for the rest of your life. And it's not meant to make us feel bad. It's just meant to help us realize that this is only, it only works if we apply it. It's not ever meant to just be a theoretical thing. It, you know, Jesus isn't talking about heaven when he says the kingdom of heaven. It's not like that's what it's going to be like when you die. It's like, no, it's the kingdom of God in the earth. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Give me a supernatural ability to forgive people. I got to hug porcupines. <laughs> Woo. Right, I know, but that's what Jesus did. He hugged porcupine. That's quite a word picture, isn't it? So I'm going to talk about the fivefold ministry through the context of this lens of what makes it hard not to judge other people. Because if everybody was just like me, the world would be a better place. See, that's how a lot of us feel. Like the way I see the world is the right way. So anybody who disagrees with me is wrong, and I have to convince them or or flame them on Facebook to prove I'm smarter than them. See, like, oh, that's not how it works, right? So you have to start by looking at the other person and thinking they, they might have something valuable to teach you, even though they're very different. How many feel like you understand your personality temperament, that you might lean in a certain direction? You know, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, that's Ephesians 4. Anybody feel like you lean towards the prophetic? Lots of hands going up. Apostolic. My wife's going to raise her hand on everyone, I think, but that's the first two. <laughs> Pastoral, all right? Teacher. Yeah, Trisha's all five. Yes, you are. You're a good teacher. <laughs> Evangelist. Yeah, so there would be evidence, right? Like, you know, Linda's hand went up. That, uh, you know, I'd definitely confirm that. So let's just think about it for a minute. I'll, I'll read it. It said, he gave himself, some, uh, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So obviously we need all five, but if we just think about an evangelist mindset versus a pastoral mindset, they're very different, right? The evangelist wants to be outwitting the lost. The pastor wants to love them in the, in the house and teach them about family and, and comforting. And those are very two different roles, which one's better? Neither is better. We need all five of them, right? The prophet can feel like they're way out there sometimes and hard to understand where the teacher needs to feel like chapter and verse, right? And you could see where the friction could come in here when you're looking at them and you're the administrative person, right? Because that's another gift, a gift of administration. Prophetic people have a hard time believing that's a spiritual gift, I think, right? Right? And they're like, man, you're never on time. You, you, know, you just don't respect the Lord. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. If, if we start the meeting at 10, don't come at 1130, okay? I was in prayer. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, them being in prayer might have been the exact thing you need to hear right now, Mr. Administration, right? So you get where I'm coming from now? We forget that we have a certain you know, matrix of gifts, right? We have a different combination of gifts, and we tend to lean towards whatever our mix is is thinking it's the right way. That's not good because you could judge somebody improperly because they're not like you. And a lot of the intercessors we've met over the years have been judged by pastors as being Jezebels because they had a strong opinion about something, and the pastor would take it as disrespectful, and it wasn't. They didn't mean it to be anyway, but, but they got hurt because they weren't given a place. They weren't given a voice. Maybe, you know, they might have jumped the wrong chain of command or whatever. I mean, we are supposed to be respectful, but they got misread. And Jezebel, boy, calling somebody Jezebel is a pretty strong thing, isn't it? Unless you're sure. And have you ever, have you ever made, uh, drawn an opinion about somebody and then later found out you were wrong? 
How do you feel when that happens? Like a jerk. Thank you. The Greek word for jerk. <laughs> it's the same word. Amazing. <laughs> so that's partly why I'm bringing out the fivefold ministry here. And, and there are many more than just those five gifts, right? There's lots of lists. There's at least 30. Peter Wagner identified 30 of them, right? So like a worship leader is really not even listed, but you know when, when somebody's leading worship and they're gifted and you know when they're not, right? Like uh, Mike Hutching sang a song on Sunday. He's not going to be on The Voice anytime soon, but it was still good, you know, because he was confident in what he did. But he wasn't applying to be a worship leader. So the thing is, can I start by saying, hey, Lord, thank you for making me the way I am, but I want to be able to learn from the matrix of gifts that are all around me. And I don't want to initially just devalue that gift because it's different or because I just can't understand their gift because they're putting their priorities in a different place than me. If you can think that way, you'll judge a lot less. And Jesus really modeled this well for us, right? Look, let's think about the woman at the well. If ever there was an easy time to judge somebody, it would have been her, right? You remember this? It's John chapter 4, and I will, I'll just kind of condense it here. He shows up at, the, at Jacob's well, actually, right? A very historic place. And this is a woman. The men didn't speak to women in that culture. And she was a Samaritan woman. The Jews didn't speak to Samaritans. And we also know he had a prophetic word for her, right? So now let's just talk about that. I mean, I remember John Paul Jackson writing a book that said how to be a prophet without being a jerk, I think it was, right? Yeah, it was something like that. Because prophetic people could come across as very black and white and angry sometimes. It's like, no, there's nothing to talk about. I'm telling you what God said. That's it. Just take your medicine like a man. All right. Well, speak the truth, but you could do it with a little bit of love. I think that's a verse in there, right? So let's just think of Jesus was a bazooka prophet. You know, he walks up to the woman at the well, and he knows that she's got five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband, so you're not even married. So you got four strikes against you. If he was a bazooka prophet, he just blows her head right off at the well there. You better get saved because you're going to hell based on your lifestyle. What does he do? Not that. How many Christians come across that way, though? Often, right? That that would be one of the negative stereotypes of Christians is that we're very judgmental. And yet one of the worst sins, as Sanford said, is to hold a bitter root judgment against people. So we're, we're, we're not making a good connection on this truth here, and the enemy's using it against us. So he, what does he do? He, he recognizes that she's got a problem, but he wants to give her the solution and not just call out the problem. Anybody can call out the problem. <laughs> Not so easy to give her a solution in a five-minute conversation. So what does he do? He engages her in a conversation. And she says, boy, it seems a little odd that me being a woman and a Samaritan and you being a Jew, that you would even talk to me because he asked her to get him some water, right? And then there's a play on words here when it comes to water. And I have water that you, if you drink it, you'll never be thirsty again. Now, isn't it interesting that she was trying to quench her thirst for feeling right about herself through relationships with men, and it wasn't working, right? Like we're on the sixth attempt here, and it's not working. But if you drink from the water I give you, see, that will quench your thirst. You'll never be thirsty again. You'll stop looking in the wrong places because the, re the relationship will be this way with God. She doesn't know that's happening in the conversation. But is it instructive for us? Yes. That as we're talking to people, God wants to give you a download, right? The Bible says when you open your mouth, he will fill it. And instead of filling it with judgment towards other people and, and railing against them and devaluing them by calling out the problem all the time, which, again, Christians are kind of known for, being judgmental, which comes across like we think we're better than other people. And that should be the last thing that we do, right? We should be humble, if anything else, because we're acknowledging our sin. And he says, you know, I'm, I'm not going to bail on you at this well, lady. I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to give you something that could help you. And she goes back into the town and says, you need to come out and see this guy that told me everything about myself. And then they said, we came out initially because of her story, but now we believe because we're here and we're seeing it ourselves, right? Wouldn't that be a good model 
to try to live by every day before you leave your house? Say, Lord, help me meet a, a Samaritan woman at the well like that today. Open my mouth, and when I speak, let it be your words coming out, not judgmental words coming out, but, but life-giving words coming out, because we are meeting these people all the time. And it's just a matter of whether we want to try to become adept at this or not. Because it's for the equipping of the saints. All these gifts are for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. So I want to give you this chart here for a minute. Because it puts those five gifts in, in, a, in an easy way to think about it. Anybody recognize this symbol? What ministry uses this? It's a, it's a ship's wheel, actually. And it's the navigator's which is a college campus ministry started by a guy named Dawson Trotman, and he was an evangelist. His, his primary gift clearly was, was evangelist, right? And he was in San Diego talking to the sailors before they would go out to, to sea for World War II. So it was during World War II, and he drew this little circle for them, as, and he was saying, look, you're a sailor. It's like a ship's wheel. You're going to be getting on this boat, and you need to find other Christians when you're on the boat, and these are the essential things you're going to need to remember as a Christian. You're going, to, you're going to need somebody in fellowship, which we would call the pastoral gift, right? You're going to need somebody to help you understand the word. You're going to need to share your faith with other people, and you're going to need to pray. See how it says it in the spoke itself? Prayer, fellowship, the word, and witnessing. And then around that whole thing is being obedient to what you read. So you're not going to fully understand everything you read as a new believer, but just try to understand you've got to be obedient to what he's asking you to do by faith. Just believe it. And he won thousands of people before they got shipped off to San Diego. And you would understand that men going into battle and war are pretty open to hear about God because they're very much in touch with their own mortality at that point. But it helps us understand that these four gifts on the outside and the apostle would be the one in the middle are very different. So the pastoral is for the, the edification of the body of believers. The evangelist is for the lost. Very different, but both really crucial to the whole operation. The teacher at the bottom wants the outline. The prophet at the top doesn't know what outline means because they're looking into the future. They're trying to hear what God is saying. So no spreadsheets. That's for the, that's for the other people on the team, not me. I'm listening. I'm open. I want to hear the word of the Lord. What's the word of the Lord? You hear the prophets talking to each other. What has the Lord been showing you? And that's where the life is, right? I mean, it's really important to be able to interpret it as a teacher. The apostle, which is what Paul, the role Paul would have played in, in the New Testament, the obvious person, is the one who tries to keep it all in balance. Because what if you apply this to a person and they're all prophetic and no word? What's the, what would you call them? Give me an adjective. Flaky. It's a good one. It's from the 70s. What was it? Nuts and, I forget now, fruits and nuts. And what if you're a teacher and no prophetic Holy Spirit? What do you call that? Legalistic. Plenty of them in the Bible. What if you're so focused on the inner church that you never reach out to the lost? Then you become yeah, inbreeding. What happens when you have inbreeding? <laughs> Not a pretty picture, Rich. <laughs> Yeah. And if you're so working on just the evangelism, they're coming in the front door and going out the back door because they're not being discipled, right? So the Apostle Paul, you could use him as an example of someone who sits in that kind of executive position in the middle and makes sure all of these things are working in sync with each other. But it's the same for us as an individual person. That Christ at the center of your life is trying to help you grow in all these areas and more, right? Because there's more gifts on here and you could try to identify it. But here's the reason I'm talking about it here with bitter roots. It might be a little hard to see the, the connection here is because start by saying maybe they're on a different part of the wheel than me and I just need to build a relationship so that I can understand them instead of thinking what a lost cause. I can't believe the church lets that person sing on the worship team because of what they said on Facebook, let's just say. Hypothetical example. No. <laughs> love believes the best. And they were talking about me. No, kidding. just kidding. Uh, love believes the best. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. If I could get people to do this, man, would we be in good shape. 
we don't typically start here. You know, we don't start with love believes the best. It's, and that's that famous chapter about love, right? Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love. Clanging symbol, right? So I'm supposed to start when I meet you by not judging you by the package, but starting by believing the best. Even if you don't make a great first impression on me, you're, you're innocent until proven otherwise. Number two, we know this one, right? Hurt people and healed people. <laughs> but when we're hurt people, we're hurting people, we, we, we defile many. So it's not, you know, when I say the rules of engagement, this is the spiritual warfare rules of engagement as it works with, with these, in, uh, I'm sorry, with bitter root judgments. How about this one? Every human being is fearfully and wonderfully made and complex in their makeup. And I can't just write them off with a label and say, uh, lost cause, no hope, forget it. Four, we said it already, where there's fruit, there's a root. So, Lord, help me understand how to crack the code to, to get beyond that surface armor that that person is putting up around themselves to protect themselves. Five, we already said, honor your mother and father, first commandment with a promise. How about if your parents are elderly now? Were you planning on living into their 90s? A lot of people know. Right. Like when I was coming up, I, I started as a financial advisor in when I was 25, 26 years old. Nobody's parents were living past 75, 80 would be a, that would have been considered old. I have a client right now my age that all four of the parents are in their mid 90s, all living in the same homes where they raise their kids, all still driving. Praise God. But these two. Friends of mine are like, oh, my God, there's going to be an accident. I can't believe it. We should take their license away. It's like they weren't planning on this. This was retirement time. Not only did they have to pay for their kids' college, now they're also having to support the next generation above, which, you know, is really a conflicting thing because they are your parents and you love them, but you just weren't planning on them being here. So honoring them, <laughs> honoring them, might not be the easiest thing to do, right? And you might be changing their diapers like they changed yours. Do you consider that an honor? It is. I know. I, I know. It's easy to say it now, but, like, it really is an honor. And, and God holds you accountable for that one because they did change your diaper when you couldn't change your own. <laughs> How about this word, big word, sanctification? And in fact, I want to just refer to one of the handouts I gave you. It's, uh, it's the one that looks like a chart, and it's got all the boxes, almost like an organization chart. And at the top it says prayer ministry, biblical counsel, ministry of reconciliation. This one. This is a really good one. Again, not just on... Um, bitter root judgments, but just on the overall process in general, when we're talking about deliverance, we're looking for God to hit the mark on what the problem is for the person, right? And we would like it to be a, a, a quick process. There's no reason it has to drag out 10 years for somebody to get healed and free and, and delivered. I mean, Jesus had one-step programs for many people. In fact, when he walked in the room, the people who had demons ran up to him and say, what are you doing here? We know who you are, right? And he had these really long, complicated prayers come out. <laughs> and he didn't yell, right? So maybe we make it more complicated than it has to be. I mean, Mike, Mike Hutchins said that too, right? So this org chart's really nice. You know, you could do a deeper dive on this. And if you're watching online, we can email this to you. But it breaks it down from a high level down to the to the lower level. I'm not going to go into it now, but really, if you could use one word, it would be the process of sanctification. It's becoming holy. It's taking what what we bring to the Lord and saying there's a process that God is plugging us into to make us more like him, sanctified, set apart, holy for the use of the Lord, for the master, right? In a great house, there's many vessels, some to honor and some to dishonor, right? So we're moving out of that kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. We're being transformed, glory to glory, but, right, 
into his image with ever-increasing glory. So this would be what we would refer to as the sanctification process with the scriptural layers involved in it, too. It's, again, it's not ours. It's from the Sanfords. I found it really helpful. So, again, are you all going to be full-time counselors? No. But are you called to understand how to counsel somebody? Yes. Biblical ministry is what we would say. The sanctification, it says, is the death side of the cross, and the transformation is the resurrection side of the cross. So one of the things I hadn't heard until I came to the Sanford's teaching was that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is not just Easter Sunday, or what we would celebrate as Passover too, right? That happened to Jesus, but it also happens to us on an ongoing basis. We don't try to fix the problem of bitter root judgment. They have to be brought to the cross. Joyce Meyer had to take her hatred of her father to the cross. She didn't fix it. She crucified it and have resurrected Joyce on the other side of that was able to love her father and lead him to the Lord and baptize him before he died. Like, you know, supernatural, right? So we're not trying to fix the problem. We're saying, Lord, I need you to take it and I want to put it on the altar and crucify it. And I trust you enough that I'm going to be a different person on the other side in the resurrection. Jesus was really dead. You know that, right? Like he was really dead. It wasn't like half dead because he was part God. He went to the cross completely trusting he was going to be raised from the dead. That took a lot of faith, all right? You might not think that, but you ponder that one. And then it breaks it down into the different layers of the types of sins that can beset us at the bottom here. And, and it gives you lots of scripture. So one day we'll, we'll unpack that. But that, in my, in my point six here, excuse me, how are we doing? All right, I see the time, 826. Sanctification is partly why we're doing this class and teaching on deliverance is because it's part of a sanctification process. And there's churches that don't teach deliverance, and that's okay. You know, they're going to have to answer to God. We're going to have to answer to God. But to, to think that this wouldn't be for today, I can't understand how you could read the New Testament and think that we shouldn't be equipped to know how to do this, right? Because that's what we're all in is, is a sanctification process. Paul said, I have not yet arrived. I have not yet apprehended the thing for which God apprehended me. That means there's still things that have to die. Pick up your cross daily. Pick up your cross daily. When they said cross in, in first century Palestine, that meant dying. That meant you were going to die. When you picked up a cross, that was it. So something in your life needs to be taken to the cross. That's not a bad thing. It's, it's, it's getting rid of, it's laying off those weights that are besetting us. So it's not something we have to be afraid or ashamed about. It's just like, look, we all got here. We're still alive. We're standing. We survived whatever plane crash that life was bringing us to. And like to think that now, like I can't ever admit I have a mistake. Wow. That would really hamper you, wouldn't it? So then verse seven in first Corinthians four or five in the message, it says, don't jump to conclusions with your judgments before all the evidence is in. <laughs> right, that's judging. That's a bitter root judgment. Have you ever been judged? Let me ask you that. Have you ever had somebody write you off and say you're hopeless and you can never change? How does that feel? Ho, oh, you're in a hole and you're never getting, they're never digging you out of that hole. You have been completely written off, right? Maybe not. You know, God could always change somebody's heart, but you know what it feels like to be banished from somebody. And that's not pretty. So it doesn't sound like a very godly characteristic, does it? And then ruling your spirit, I always throw that one in. Proverbs 25, 28 says, a man or woman who does not rule their spirit is like a city with the walls broken down, right? That they're open to attack. They're vulnerable to attack. So if you constantly have bad fruit of a bad temper and it's expressing itself in road rage, that could be deadly around here, Right? And it is, does express itself as road rage. Well, maybe one day the guy's got a gun in the car in front of you and you pop out of your car and, and that's it, right? Because you're acting in a threatening manner. Well, look, it can, it can kill you. So ruling your spirit is a very present help in time of trouble. And it is fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? Galatians 5.16, temperance, self-control. You can ask the Lord. If you're having a hard time ruling one of your emotions, ask him. He'll help you. And then we already said the law of increase works both ways. You sow the wind, you reap the whirlwind. You sow a blessing, you reap a bigger blessing back, not judging people. And then 
I'm going to say the prayer at the end here and answer any questions that people might have. I hope I hope I covered it enough so that you can apply it in your lives, but also think about how when you're talking to other people, you might see where they have a bitter root judgment against somebody, and you could just try to unpack that with them with Holy Spirit's you know advice because it's not usually hard. Like bitterness is one of those things that shows up on someone's face, right? You can tell. I heard one author said, by the time you're 40, everybody has the face that they deserve. (laughs) That hurts, right? It is good. That's why I remembered it. So, like, one of the heroes that I've, you know, I think we should all study church history, right? There's been some incredible people. That's what I started in, in Hebrews 11. You know, by faith, Moses, by faith, Abraham. There's all these heroes. But there's also modern day heroes. And you've probably heard about the book, The Hiding Place. How many have read it? A lot of people in here read it. Trisha had both The Hiding Place and the follow-up book called Tramp for the Lord that Corey Ten Boom wrote when we got married. And I hadn't read it prior to us getting married. So I read the two copies that she had, first The Hiding Place, then Tramp for the Lord. And I was bawling my eyes out just reading those two books because it's a, a different world, right? They were in Holland when when the Nazi Germans came in and overtook the country and all the Jews in their little town were all being taken off and brought to the prison camps. And they built a little hiding place in their house. And for quite a while, they got a lot of people out, a lot of the Jews out, but then they got caught and they got sent to the prison camp themselves. And they write, and Corey Ten Boom survives it. And it's actually her sister, Betsy, who Corey talks about as being more Christian than Corey herself. And, and when you see it through that angle, it's, it's even more amazing because Corey was the one that survived. Betsy died in the prison camp. But there's so many little vignettes that you could look at of how the, the carnal mind would have looked at a situation versus how the person that's trying to behave like Christ and has integrated Christ into their character would behave. So they got out to this crowded boxcar, right, where everybody's acting like an animal. They were just stuffed in there, and they were in there for days, and everybody's just fighting with each other, all the women. And and all she did was just start talking to the other people and saying, well, maybe if I move this way and you move that way, we can try to make this work a little bit better. And before you knew it, the atmosphere in the car changed because one person showed a little kindness. Another time they were in the prison, and Corey was in one part of the prison, and she didn't even know if Betsy was still alive, but the prison guard showed kindness to her and said, I'm going to walk you past her cell so you can see that she's okay. So right in there. But then as Corey's walking by and the guard actually slows down a little to let her pause and look in, she notices that Betsy has fixed up the cell. So they had cellophane, I guess, that they put around put around the uh the light bulb that was sticking from the wall. They had put coats up on. Like she made it like a house in the middle of hell, okay, in the middle of a prison. Then she's being beaten by one of the guards in the prison. This is Betsy now, and Corey's like hating the guard. And while she's being beaten is, is where this scene comes in, where Betsy gets, well, we could just read it. Corey is speaking, and she says, Betsy, how long will it take? meaning like we're going to get out of here and then we're going to do some ministry. We're going to try to help people once we get out of this prison. How long will it take? And then Betsy says, perhaps a long time, perhaps many years, but what better way could there be to spend our lives? So Betsy's talking about ministering to people who were in the prison after they get out. (laughs) What better way to spend our lives? Well, a lot of people could think of a better way because you wouldn't have wanted to be ministering to the people in the prison. I turned to stare at her. Corey says, what are you talking about? And Betsy is looking at the prison guards. These young women, that girl back at the bunkers. Corey, if people can be taught to hate, they can be taught to love. See what loving your enemies looks like while they're killing you. (laughs) If they can be taught to hate, they can be taught to love. We must find the way, you and I, no matter how long it takes. She went on almost forgetting in her excitement to keep her voice to a whisper while I slowly took in the fact that she was talking about the prison guards. I glanced at the matron seated at the desk ahead of us, and I saw a gray uniform and a visored hat. Betsy saw a a wounded human being. 
Yeah, there's so many wows. Like, I can't even tell you. And if you, I, I'm not going to read everything I handed you out tonight, but there's a couple of more of those vignettes in that handout that I gave you that I'll just summarize one of them, which is really amazing. So right before she dies, she's, she goes into a vision, like an open vision, Betsy does, and she describes a, a, a mansion that they were going to have after they got out of prison where they were going to minister to people, both German soldiers that, that were guards, and then also people that had been, that survived that were helping the Jews or the Jews that survived, right? And she went into great detail about it. So then she's back and she's back in her normal life again, Corey, and going out and ministering. And at the end of one of the meetings, like tonight, let's just say, a lady comes up and says, I heard you talk about your sister and the vision that she had, and I still have one of my children hasn't come back from the war yet. But if he comes back from the war, I want to help you out with your sister's vision. So, like, I don't know when, sometime later, she gets a note at the door saying, my son came back home. Would you come and see the house that I want you to use that your sister had as the vision? 56-room mansion that they were given. And it was down to the detail of what Betsy described while she was dying to the point where when, when Corey pulls up, it's like, oh, my God. Like, it's exactly what she said. And the lady started to say things. Like, one of the things Betsy said is it would be really good if the Germans were gardening because when you're gardening, that brings you back into touch with life again. So the lady that's shown her the house goes, yeah, we've kind of let the gardens go a little bit, but we want to refresh them. Do you think that would be a good idea? And Corey's like, oh, my God. She's watching me right now from heaven. And then the lady says, yeah, we want to take you inside. And Corey says, does it have a spiral staircase with inlaid glass windows? And the, and the owner goes, oh, you've been here? Because how else would you know that? And Corey didn't want to lie. And she says, well, no. And she kind of paused, and the lady says, oh, somebody that you know was here? <laughs> and it was her sister who was long gone, right? So that's all I'm saying. Like, there's so much more reward than what we can imagine that if we'll just do it the Lord's way, you might not see the immediate thing and it might feel, it's otherworldly that you could have that much love for people that hate you, right? Sets the bar really high, but I'm encouraged by that, that my life doesn't have that kind of extreme thing going on, but I can at least try, okay? So what I'd like to end with before the questions is just a prayer that I gave you for Bitter Roots. And then just maybe before the prayer, I'll just read one other thing. There's one that has a guy with a cross, like an arm going up to the cross. I just want to read that quickly. It's a really good summary. It says, God has written balance and retribution into the universe because we've all made judgments that we are due to reap. We draw to ourselves people who are best designed to deliver the reaping. You believe that? So let me ask you a question. Just look up for a minute. How many of you know somebody who might have been raised in a violent home? That uh, one of your girlfriends in high school had a father who was physically abusive. And then maybe she was dating a guy who was physically abusive in high school or married a guy that was physically abusive. Why do you think that is? Sorry? Sorry? They marry what they saw. Yeah, there was like, that seemed normal to them. Their friends could look and say it wasn't, but they didn't understand that that, that, that wasn't normal because it's just what the, their muscle memory they got accustomed to. So this says that we, we draw to ourselves those people who are best designed to deliver that reaping, right? Like that seems unfair, but it's really not if we're, our eyes are open to it it'll help us track back to what the root of the problem is based on what we're dealing with. So when people wanting ministry come in with marriage problems, it's almost always 50-50. A wife will most likely do to her husband that for which he bitterly judged his mother. <laughs> and the wife will most likely reap through her husband the very thing for which she judged her father. Doesn't seem fair, does it? Until it gets exposed and you know how to deal with it, then you can compensate for it by bringing healing into that situation. It's painful when a couple begins to discover hidden things about one another. 
Many conclude that they made a mistake and married the wrong person, but no. God did not design our mates to make us comfortable. Rather, we tend to marry someone who designed to grind. (laughs) A beloved enemy (laughs) who triggers whatever we have stored in our hearts. And as we take our sins to the cross, we can enter into a blessed relationship with our mates and others, fulfilling God's will for transformation in our lives. Yeah, that's a pill to swallow right there, huh? Well, remember when David had to go fight Goliath? What weapon did he use? And where did he go to get his rocks? Why did he go to the river? Why did the why were the stones smooth? Friction. They were bumping up against the other rocks. So just tell your husband he's a rockhead. We're bumping up against each other to smooth off the rough spots so that we can fly smooth. It was pretty good up to that point, Rich, huh? (laughs) All right, so you got the prayer? You got a one-pager here with the prayer, and I also have it on the screen. So this is for the person receiving the prayer. We're assuming that, you know, the Lord has uncovered some things, It's really good to journal as you're going through these classes on deliverance. It's good to take notes for your own life and to journal what the Lord is showing you about you because often it will come as clues that you can put together like puzzle pieces. So let's just say I'm the person receiving the prayer. I say, Lord, I recognize that I have judged my father for not being around when I was a young child, and I've locked myself into that same behavior and attitude, just saying, You know, that would have been one of the things for me. I choose to forgive him for hurting me, and I choose to release my right to hold this offense against him, knowing it's up to you alone to judge all of us. Please forgive me for the sinful ways that I've reacted and for the ways in which I've done the very same thing to others because the judgment was driving that behavior. So I'm I'm asking him to purge my heart of that thing. And it's really wonderful if you can make right with the person while they're alive. Because often parents are not here to talk to them anymore. Now, um, I would go to say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for judging. Now that I see I'm reaping the same pattern throughout my life, I choose to forgive and release my anger and bitterness to you, Lord. Please remove it from my heart. Forgive me also for my part in tempting other people, fill in the blank, to do the very thing I hated by the power of my bitter root expectancies and judgments. Okay, tracking? You could need a few copies of this page, fill in a different name on each one, right? And then the prayer minister, which this is a biblical truth, right, that we can release forgiveness to somebody from the ministry seat, can say, I forgive you. And as a servant of Jesus Christ, I say to you that as you've forgiven those who've wounded you, so also has the Lord forgiven you. Lord, I ask you to break each judgment that has been named and remove it from Peter's life. I ask you to consume the reaping of all the years of sowing destruction. Replace it with your blessing. And I ask you to bring experiences into Peter's life as evidence these judgments are no longer operating. Strengthen Peter in the inner man to be able to practice new responses and continue to bring awareness of any other judgment in the perfection of your timing, Lord. So last thing, and I know coming up on quarter to nine already. So part of believing the best about people and them telling you that they want to change if you're in a marriage is recognizing that the change process is really hard. Because there's so much of a a pattern that developed in our lives. Let's just say somebody got really quiet and and had a passive-aggressive tendency and just would clam up, and you'd go to them and say, you know, what's the matter? Nothing. And, you know, everybody knows something's the matter, and there's just this game going on, right? So what if they want to change and they don't want to do the silent treatment anymore? What do they do? Help me out, class talk they have to tell they have to tell the other person what their feelings are but they don't know how to do that so are they going to be very good at it at the beginning no so you could shame them 
and say, oh, my God, you know, that was so awkward what you said. Or you could just totally cheer them on and say, hallelujah, you didn't give me the solid treatment. What you said wasn't so well delivered, but at least you're trying, <laughs> right? Like that's when they need the most encouragement when they're trying to change. Because if you shut them down in that moment when they're being vulnerable, man, it could just dive back in that hole and take another year before it comes back out again. Because that would be the thing that they don't want to have to deal with. They don't want to be shamed into trying to change their behavior, right? So maybe, you know, because you love each other and you're talking, it's you could just say, I feel like it's not going to come out too well, but I want to try because <laughs> you told me I should just tell you what I'm thinking and let them blurt it out and say, bravo, you know, like, praise God. That takes courage. The easy thing to do is just keep working in the pattern that you know, even if you know it's not that healthy because it's familiar. But that's not changing and growing, is it? All right. So, amen. Let's just pray to close it and ask the Lord to show us in his kindness. The kindness of God leads us to repentance, right? I was just going to pray and then ask for questions. Is that all right? Okay. So, Lord, we're just so grateful for the truth of your word, for the power of your law, for both blessing and, and that sowing and reaping that happens on the blessing side. That's what we choose to look at, Lord, is that the, the blessing that comes through obedience to your word and a willingness to just hold a reflective mirror in front of our lives and recognize where we may have judged other people. So we ask you, Holy Spirit, bring it to the surface. Help us to recognize it as sin. Bring it to the person if they're still alive and repent to them and ask for forgiveness for judging them and devaluing them in any way. And then, Lord, cleanse us. You said if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from any iniquity that attaches itself to us. Like we read in Hebrews, Lord, we don't want anything slowing us down on this race so that we might continue to pr progress and do great exploits as your children, as your ambassadors in this kingdom in the earth. So I just bless your people for being open to hearing this teaching and to implement it into their lives in Jesus' name. Amen.